Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It happens once a year, usually, uh, when the sun comes right here. Usually it's on all of you, and I see it traveling around. And, you guys go, and once a year, usually there's a point at which it's on me. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're talking today about uh, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness and really one of his first major testing grounds in his ministry uh, was right at the very beginning. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but when, um, when we read the scriptures, um, particularly the gospels, I often think to myself, I wonder how this story was first communicated to the writer. So Luke is here, but this, this is told in every one of the, um, the gospel, or three, three out of four of the gospel readings, this story of Jesus' temptation is told. And in this one particular, I wonder sometimes how it was first communicated to the disciples who wrote it down, because none of them were there for it. It happened prior to them. Um, just conjecture. I wonder if it happened in the disciples' own temptations. Okay? I wonder if one night, perhaps, they were just sitting around the fire with Jesus. They'd been traveling with him for however many years. And if they just said to him, Jesus, you know what we really struggle with um, as your disciples? is temptation. The temptation to go back home. The temptation to uh, leave and fall somebody else. We struggle with the temptation of how hard this has been. We struggle with the temptation of how much we've had to give up. We struggle with the temptation of, uh, of just, just feeling our own waywardness. And can you teach us what we might do in these situations? And if Jesus in that moment, because none of them were there for this, if that was potentially the first time where he opened up his own mouth and said, let me tell you about a time where I was tempted, and told them of his own temptation in the wilderness and how he overcame Satan's temptation um, in his own time of testing. So that's what we're going to think about and consider today, this first outset week of of Lent is the nature of temptation um, and how we as Christians might fight against it. Because in our own lives as Christians, temptation, if we're honest and if we're aware, um, temptation is a, is a real part. If you are all seeking to live a life wholly devoted to God, then you will know that Satan regularly tempts us to this day. Okay. And so Luke 4 becomes extremely instructive for our lives as Christians. Let me begin just by making um, a, a kind of distinction that, that's worth noting in the, in the text um, of Scripture. So there is in Scripture testing and tempting. Testing and tempting. Those two things. And they're very different, and they come from very different places, and they um, are, but they, they can seem very similar sometimes. So the, the Word of God will tell us that God tests us. Okay? God tests us. This is why um, James will start out in the first chapter of James by saying, Kind of all joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because in trials and testing, God refines our faith. Okay? So God tests us. Satan tempts us. So as we see, Jesus is driven out by the Spirit into the wilderness. And in the wilderness, Satan comes and tempts him. Okay? The distinction is this. Temptation is meant for our destruction. Testing is meant for our growth. Okay? Temptation is meant for our destruction. Testing is meant for our growth. Satan uses temptation to draw us in to sin 
and to fall into his plan. As I said from John 10, 10 today, Jesus teaches his disciples that the enemy, Satan, comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And the primary way that he does that is through temptation. We all face it, okay? Um, but it's meant for our destruction. Testing is meant for our own spiritual growth. Okay? So the reason like a teacher will test their students is in order that they might grow in knowledge and understanding. No teacher malevolently, even, even though it might seem like this sometimes, no teacher malevolently gives their students a test in order to shame them and show them how bad they are. Okay? Nobody, no, no good teacher, no teacher worth their soul gives a student back his or her test and says, you are just the worst. <laughs> Look at that, a D minus. You'll get those the rest of your life, pal. Okay? Any teacher who would ever do that should be taken from their job and, uh, I don't know, sent to be a garbage man or a garbage woman or something. Because <laughs> that's all they're <laughs> um, No, a teacher or a coach or a parent, sometimes will test their children or students or pupils or athletes in order to press them further, to help them get, go further in whatever they're studying. And what I want you to note is that the same event can be used by God to test and grow you and can be used by Satan to tempt and seek to destroy you. And that is the nature of Luke 4, when Jesus is sent into the wilderness. God is using it to strengthen not only Jesus, but also his disciples that he would tell later, you and I now, okay? And, he, and simultaneously, God uses this period of trial to try to tempt Jesus into falling, as he did Adam. Now, we learn also in this it's a very good picture of the tactics of Satan, okay? So, note when Satan comes to Jesus. I'll just read it for you. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, okay, that, that, that acknowledges that God is sending him out into the wilderness for his purposes. He's being driven out into the wilderness for God's purposes. That's part of the testing, okay? Jesus is driven out. Uh, by the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit, returned to the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days. He was there for 40 days. Um, and he was being tempted by the devil. So that, you know, that, that distinction is right there. Okay? And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him. Now just note for a second at what point the devil decides to speak. He comes to Jesus at his greatest moment of weakness, vulnerability, and isolation. Jesus is in the wilderness. He's been there for 40 days, and he hasn't eaten at all. He's drank water. He has not eaten. Now, this is, for a man Jesus' size at this time, is, is probably um, miraculous that he could survive at all for 40 days. Um, but he does, and he, but it is at his greatest mode of, of weakness. That's why it says he's tired, he's hungry, and that is when Satan comes to him and tempts him. Satan, too, will attack you and I at times in our greatest moments of weakness, vulnerability, and isolation, okay? So when you are tired or overwhelmed or exhausted, have you ever noticed that you might be more short-tempered, might be willing to say things that you don't actually mean and that are hurtful, okay? Uh, in moments of isolation, you might be tempted to do things or think things or pursue things that you should not because what? Nobody's looking, okay? In moments of weakness, in moments of sadness 
or grief or spiritual weakness, that is often when Satan will lay on the guilt additionally and push you further into sin. You notice that this is an interesting, name, like just the nature of sin and temptation. Oftentimes, when we fall into sin, a whole cascade of other sins come after that. So when you lie, that generally gives way to greater temptation to lie more. Okay? Or think about King David. King David's a great example of that. Commits adultery, commits, or commits lust against Bathsheba, uh, commits adultery against Bathsheba, then he sends his wife into the front lines to die, commits murder, and then lies about it and seeks to cover it up over and over and over again. Sin begets sin, temptation begets temptation. Okay? And in the moments when we are weakest and we feel the kind of largest amounts of guilt or shame, that is when Temptation comes on strong. Is it, any, is it any wonder that when Peter is tempted to deny his Lord, he does it once, he does it twice, he does it three times in his greatest moments of weakness? So I say that just to tell you to be aware in moments where you feel, I mean, like it can even be as simple as like moments where you feel hungry or tired, or worn out, or exhausted. Just have your guard. Moments where you feel weak, or that you have failed the Lord, or done what is wrong, be cautious because the devil will want to lay it on more. Okay? Moments where you are isolated or alone, be cautious. Okay? All right. So he comes, that's one of the tactics. He comes where we are weak, vulnerable, isolated. The second thing he does that you'll notice is he attacks our identity in Christ. And for Jesus here, he attacks his very identity as the Son of God. So, the first temptation, the devil says, what does he say? He says, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. Now, a lot of times when people say, read that, they think to themselves, well, the temptation is to make bread. Okay? The temptation is to, he's very hungry, and the temptation is to make bread so that he can eat it. Yeah, well, sure, that, that is part of it. But I would say the real temptation is in the if. If you are the Son of God, then make that bread. I know you're hungry, Jesus. So what if he doesn't? Then the devil can lay it on even thicker and say to him, Ah, you must not be the Son of God. Okay? The temptations are not much different for us, actually. When Satan attacks us, he often attacks our identity in Christ and he attacks the goodness of God. Even from the very beginning, do you remember in the garden, okay, um, he tempts Adam and Eve with this forbidden fruit by saying that God does not want them to know the knowledge of good and evil. He's withholding things from them because he doesn't really love or care for them. If you hear that language in your own mind, or in your own heart, or in, uh, or in those around you, okay? Understand that those are the words of Satan. Jesus would never say to you, you are not my son, you are not my daughter, you are not my beloved. But we can sometimes. Have you ever listened to uh, like the your own sort of self-talk in the midst of sin, and particularly in the midst of temptation when we fall into temptation, okay? The kind, of, the kind of narrative that we can go down, oh, you are always like this. You always lose control, you always, you, you, you always do this, you always do that. You're terrible, you are the worst. Yeah, and, and you can begin to question your very own identity in Christ, right? That's, that, those, are, those are the words of Satan would say, ah, you're not really the son. Okay? You are not really a child of God. That's what Satan's attacking here. Okay? 
He also, uh, you see him twist God's word. Okay? Um, you see him twist God's word. Actually, when he twists God's word, you see that in the last temptation. Okay? Because Jesus will cite back to him over and over and over again scripture. Okay? But he tempts him the third time by twisting God's word and saying, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and he twists the word of God. Okay? Does the same, the very same thing to Eve in the wilderness, or in the, um, in the Garden of Eden, when he says, did God really say you shall not eat of the fruit? Did God really say that? Okay? He's twisting God's word. It's the very same thing here. Okay? The last thing he does is he always tempts with power and control. So in his second temptation, he puts up all the kind of power and wealth and riches and authority of all the nations right before Jesus' feet. He puts it right before him and says, it's all yours if you will bow down and worship. What's he tempting with? He's tempting with power, authority, and control. In our own lives, oftentimes temptation uh, can come from the desire to control a situation, to have the thing that we want, to gain pleasure or desired things or control in life. That's the reason that people lie. That's the reason that people lust. That's the reason why people steal. That's the reason why people covet. That's the reason why people disregard authority, dishonor their fathers and mothers. The reason they do that is because Satan constantly tempts with power and control. That's what he holds out and says, this could be yours if you just do the thing that I say. Okay? If you just listen to me. Okay? So, he comes when we're weak and vulnerable and isolated. He attacks our identity in Christ. He twists the word of God. And he tempts with power and control. But look at Jesus' response in each one of these cases. So Jesus' response is uh, wonderful. And it's the reason that this is written in Scripture for us is that we might emulate. The first thing that I want you to know is that Jesus' way is prepared through prayer and fasting. So before he's even tempted, he's driven out into the wilderness for 40 days of prayer and fasting. Okay? This, is, this is instructive for us. Before the devil comes to tempt him, Jesus has already girded himself. He's already armored himself with prayer and fasting. The reality is, in the moments of temptation, that you take into temptation what you have already prepared and armored yourself with before you tempt. Okay? You take into winter what you've stored up in the summer. So Jesus knows he's going to be tempted and prepares himself for that temptation through prayer and fasting. Okay? That's a good practice for us. If you want to be people who are able to resist temptation when it comes, be people who are grounded in prayer and grounded in our own spiritual disciplines. It's actually what we're going to be talking about in Bible class in these coming weeks, is spiritual disciplines. Fasting is one of them. It's, it is the, is the willful and chosen rejection of certain things that we desire setting them aside and disciplining our own bodies and hearts and souls to be obedient to God. So people will give up things for Lent at times. Chocolate, you know, uh, cholesterol, uh, other things like that. Those are good practices, good physical training for us, okay? I would also say uh, it's wise sometimes to take things up during Lent as well. Whether it's saying, hey, I'm gonna, during these next 40 days, I'm going to devote myself to an attitude of prayer. And before I do anything else in the morning, okay, I'm going to sit down and pray uh, the Lord's Prayer. I'm going to pray for my loved ones. I'm going to pray for the needs of my family. I'm going to pray to honor Christ in my own life, that his name may be hallowed as it is in heaven. Okay? That is a good practice, and that will gird you and prepare you for the moments of temptation. So Jesus is firmly planted in prayer, fasting. He's firmly also planted in God's Word. So in verses 4, 8, and 12, 
of Luke chapter 4, where Jesus is in the wilderness, and every single moment that he is tempted, do you know what he responds with? He responds with the same thing. It is written. And he cites Deuteronomy 6, a chapter that he would have had that memorized. Jesus is not getting out the scroll of Deuteronomy and rolling it out in final chapter 6 in the mode of temptation saying, well, you know, uh, actually, Satan, God says this. He, he can't do that. He doesn't do that. He has the word that's stored up in his heart for the time of temptation. Okay? We have the luxury of Scripture. You, you have it on your phone. You have it in front of you. You have it, you have it all over the place. You do have the opportunity to open up the Word of God, to search it in moments of temptation. But I'll just tell you that if you really, really want to resist temptation, have the Word of God hidden in your heart, as the psalmist says. Have it hidden there, ready for action. Okay, so that in the moment of temptation, you can take it off the shelf and say, no, this is not true because I know the word of God. And then he rejects the three things that Satan holds out to him. He rejects self-reliance, saying man shall not live on bread alone. He rejects false power, okay, um, by saying uh, that you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And he rejects fame and any level of spectacle. When, God's, when Satan says, jump off the temple so that everybody can see this great miracle unfold before them and know that you are actually the Son of God. He rejects that as well and says uh, to, God, uh, to God that you shall, to the Savior, that you shall not put the Lord to the test. Okay? I think that as a church and as individuals, these three particular sins are, or these three particular temptations are worth us being conscious of. Rejection of self-reliance, that, we that we depend on the Lord Jesus. The rejection of power and control, that he is the one who guides our lives. And the rejection of any sort of like uh, uh, attention drawing or attention seeking, saying that God is the one who receives the glory and we are not claimed to the test. Now, I want to draw your attention to one other thing here. Um, notice how it ends. It ends in what uh, like a, a literature teacher would call foreshadowing. And when Jesus says, you shall not put the Lord to, to the test, it says, and when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. That's Luke pointing us forward into the future. What is that opportune time? What is that opportune moment? Well, you see it just before Jesus goes to the cross, when in another time of isolation, in another time when his disciples could have gone with him, but left him behind, in another time of isolation, in another time of prayer, and another time of temptation and deep weight and weakness, Jesus sweats blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying to his Father before he goes to the cross, asking God to take this cup from him. The Lord says no, and Jesus, because he is prepared in the moment of temptation, willfully says, I will do your will, Father. Not my will, but thine be done. And conquers both sin, Satan, death, and temptation on the cross. Okay? That's what it's talking about. That was the opportune time, and Jesus in that moment was prepared as well. I want you to remember something as people and individuals who often come under Satan's temptation. If you are a Christian, if you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, you have a target on your back. Okay? You have a target on your back. Satan will seek to destroy your faith, your trust, your hope, your reliance on God. Okay? But remember that Jesus Christ overcame temptation in the wilderness, in the garden, on the cross, and in the empty tomb. Jesus and Satan, I've said this before, but I need to, there's the right. Jesus and Satan are not equal, opposite forces. It is not yin and yang. 
It is not uh, the devil on one side and Jesus on the other, okay? Like equal and opposite forces. That is not. It is the devil who tempts us and Jesus Christ, your Lord, whose spirit lives in you, who conquered temptation and sin and Satan and the devil on the cross, crushing sin. That is it. Okay? It is, it is maybe the devil whispering in your ear, but it is the mighty and victorious Lord who crushes sin and temptation, who is on your side. And please do not forget it. Hebrews reminds us of this. Uh, in the book of Hebrews, it says, um, since, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our uh, weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. That's the invitation. That in the moment of temptation, you remember, I have the Lord Jesus on my side who conquered Satan. He can and will help me in my own moment of temptation. Paul reminds uh, the Corinthians of this, and I'll, I'll read this as my closing, closing word to you. He, re he reminds the Corinthians of this. He says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. That's very really helpful for me sometimes when I'm tempted to just say, like, this isn't anything new. Okay? This way that I'm feeling tempted is a way that countless other people have, have been tempted throughout time. It is not uncommon. And God has overcome this temptation and will overcome it in me as well. Okay? So it says, no temptation has overcome you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can do it. When you face temptation in the wilderness, when you feel isolated, alone, or weak, look for the door out. Look for the invitation from the good shepherd who conquered sin, saying, come, this is the way. Follow me. Leave the temptation. Flee and come. Okay? As a church, it is, it is wise for us to know both the way that Satan works in his tactics, but also, and far more important, the way that Christ leads us out of temptation and leads us in a period of testing that we might grow in faith and trust and knowledge that he is the one who conquers sin, Satan, temptation in our lives. Okay? So let's pray together and then we will sing. Heavenly Father, help us in our hour of temptation to, uh, uh, to, to, to converse it as you have. That his uh, head may be crushed underneath our feet, for you live in us. And may we be people who confess our sins, trust in you, and follow uh, the way out that you lead us into. To your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's go to God. God, that's enough time. It's an awful